So, the words of Hope Johnson. We are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive, we care deeply, we live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility, being forgiven through grace, creating the beloved community, together we are one. Thank you, Kelly. And please let me know in the room if you're having any trouble hearing virtually and same with folks online. You can also chat into the Zoom if you're having trouble hearing, you can chat the hosts. All right, so we just heard opening words from Kelly. We're gonna briefly go through the agenda here. Thank you everybody for being here today. It's great to have quorum on a day as nice as it is today. So really appreciate folks taking um, the time out of their afternoons to be with us for the parish meeting. Um, so we will, uh, our, our agenda is pretty packed today. Um, lots of things to go over. So we will try to keep it moving along after a brief review of um, logistics and how to vote. We'll vote on our minutes from last last parish meeting. We have a number of board candidates to vote on along with foundation board candidates to vote on. Um, we'll have an update from the foundation from Connie Beam. Um, we will talk about the 23-24 budget and vote for approval. Um, and Monica will be reviewing that with us. And then we also will be um, reviewing the, the draft vision and mission statements that the committee has, um, has come up with. And we will vote on approving those. And Emily Smith will be walking us through that. We'll end with a closing from Reverend Kelly AJ. All right, so um, folks in the room um, should have seen packets coming into the parish meeting. So you have all of the handouts listed here. For people online, um, these are all available to you online. Um, and if someone wouldn't mind chatting the link to the documents into um, the Zoom, that would be great. So maybe one of the board members that's online, I believe Monica's sharing slides, so she's not able to. So if someone could grab that and put it in the chat, that'd be great. Otherwise, they um, were also in the email that came as an announcement for the parish meeting as well. Okay. So I think we mostly know the drill here. Um, I like that it says, uh, that it, it will be just like it, it, when we only had in-person meetings, which I don't even know if anyone can remember anymore. Um, this is becoming very routine for us. So um, it's great to be able to be together in person and virtually. So we'll be doing the same voting procedure as we have before for those who haven't been with us before. Um, we are going to, so we establish quorum, we have quorum um, and we will be doing voice votes um, for all of the items on the agenda. Um, please only vote if you're eligible and you can unmute on Zoom um, to express a voice vote. If we do have a vote where there needs to be more of a count and it's not unanimous, um, we'll make sure to go through uh, to, to count each of the nay votes, pre presumably on Zoom, and then in the room, they'll be able to count those by a hand raise. So not so different from just everyone being in the room, but um, we'll start with a voice vote to see if we need to do any counts. You can absolutely uh, message 
like I said, the host for any logistical issues or any questions that are coming up on Zoom as well. And then people in the room um, can raise their hands for questions. Thanks. Yep, we can move forward. Any, uh, I guess before we approve the, the last meeting's minutes, um, any other logistical items that I didn't mention that any uh, of the board members or Monica or Kelly and Kelly have to jump in with? All right, good. Well then let's start out with approval of our minutes from the last, par last parish meeting, October 30th, last fall. Um, and I will look for a motion to approve. And if it's in the room, someone needs to tell me it happened. I motion to approve the meetings from the October 30th parish meeting. All right, Becky Burns. Thank you. And a second. I'll second. Room two. So we've got a first and a second. Gotcha. Okay. I'll let Ann decide which one she wants to get up through here. So <laughs> Hannah, Hannah Lee online um, for a second. Good. Then um, all who are in favor, please come off mute and say aye or say aye in the room. Aye. 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 And any opposed, please come off mute and say nay. All right. Nothing online and in the room. You're good in the room. All right. Thank you. That's our warm up, everybody. Okay. All right. So nominees for uh, FUS Board of Trustees and the Foundations Board of Trustees. So um, we have a we have a list this year. There are three of us rolling off the board in the coming year. So um, myself, Lorna Aronson, and John McGavna are all rolling off of the board. Um, and I, I guess before we jump into new board candidates, um, huge thank you to John and Lorna who have brought uh, a ton of a ton of wisdom and, and hard work to the board and really, really appreciate um, everything that they've done. I think Lorna, this is her like fourth time serving on the board or something like that. Um, John served a six year term and so really appreciate all of their work. All right, let's move into new members that we would like to welcome on. So first we have Chuck Evenson uh, as a board candidate. Um, very excited to um, to ask Chuck to be on the board and you can, I won't read through his bio here, but you can take a look at it on the screen. Emily Smith um, is also a board candidate. Um, and I, I'll mention that um, both Emily and Chuck served on the search committee um, that, um, for when we called Kelly AJ. And our third board, board candidate is Ed Zapala, um, and um, Ed has been involved with the interim ministry period and a number of other things at FUS. So um, three candidates that we're very, very excited to, um, to hopefully have on the board this year. All right, then I will look for a motion to approve these three board members for three year terms. We have Lorna Aronson moves approval. Motion in the room. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and a second. Who do you want me to ask the orange? We have a second in the room as well. Okay. Wonderful. When all in favor. Please aye. come off mute and say aye, or say aye in the aye. room. Aye. 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 <laughs> Enthusiastic eyes. Uh, any opposed, please say nay. Thank you. And a uh, uh, report back from the room. You're good. We good? All right. Lovely, thank you. And congratulations to our three new board members. We're very excited to have you be with us. I see clapping in the room. Yay, wonderful. 
Emily Cusick Putnam has been on the board um, for the last couple years, and we would like to approve her to a one year term as the Board of Trustees secretary um, that will bring her to the end of her first term. Um, so I will look for a motion to approve Emily into the secretary role. Motion in the room. All right, motion in the room and a second. Second it as well. All right, thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say nay. All right. Report back from the room. Are we good to move on? All right, thank you all. All right, um, so another exciting uh, portion of our, our meeting today is that we have a number of youth that are interested in being involved with the board. Um, so many, in fact, that it's more than um, than we generally have on the board. Uh, we don't absolutely want to encourage that enthusiasm. It's so wonderful to see um, it, it, so many of our coming of age folks wanting to be involved. So um, we have two youth board members and then a youth board liaison that we'll be um, inviting to the board today. So um, Zizi Brandt uh, will be the youth board liaison um, that's not a, an official role in our bylaws. We don't need to vote on it, but we're excited to have her involved. Um, and Zizi um, is very excited about trying to bring teens together um, in, in a youth group. And I think all of us are, are very excited about um, that enthusiasm and passion as well. Then Miro Roffers is one of our official youth advisor candidates for the Board of Trustees. Um, so excited to, to welcome her onto the board. And also Mason Shadel um, will be a youth advisor to the Board of Trustees as well. So really great to um, have these voices in the room with us in the Board of Trustees meetings and really make sure that, that we are um, incorporating all generations into the decision making and the discussions that take place at the board level. So I will look for a motion again to uh, vote on our youth board advisors. I yes, move to approve them. Thank you, Becky. And a second. Second in the Second. room. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Please say nay. All right. And report back from the room. I heard some clapping, so I'll assume good news. <laughs> Okay, we got to move on. Congratulations to our, our youth um, board members and advisors and liaisons. Very excited, and we appreciate your participation. All right, our last slate of candidates here is to approve um, the FUS Foundation's Board of Trustees members. Um, we have Kendall Harrison, Carol Stang, and Kurt Steggy that we would like to vote on to um, three-year terms. So I will entertain a motion again. I so move. Savage moves. All right. In a second. Second. Hannah, second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say nay. All right. Nothing online and in the room. How are we doing? Hello, Do we have the eye votes in the room? We can't hear yes. anything. Okay, thank you. All right, wonderful. 
Then I will welcome Connie Beam um, to speak about the FUS Foundation and give us the update. I believe Connie's in the room. I am. Hello? Yep. Can you hear me online? We can. Thanks, Connie. Okay. But you, you can hear me here. Okay. All right. Wow. It's so great to be here. Um, we haven't given a report to the congregation in about three years. And uh, so we're glad to actually have one in your hands today. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know what the uh, foundation is, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation established by this congregation in 1973. And uh, our purpose is to accumulate funds and every, invest them, and then every year make a payment to the FUS uh, congregation to use for its programs and services. Some of our funds are restricted, some of our funds are not restricted. So uh, it, it just depends, and if you look at the report in front of you, you can see that we have, uh, at this stage in the game, we have about $3.3 .3 million in assets. And so every year we pay out about 5% of that market value to FUS to use for their intended purposes. You can further see down on the bottom how those distributions uh, are, are uh, put into the budget of FUS. So you can see that facilities gets about 35%, programs 23%, social justice 7%, general operations 27 and youth and campus 8%. Our current distribution to this year's budget, the fiscal year 23, is, as you can see there, 177,547. Um, next year's contribution is going to be about the same because <laughs> of the very poor returns that we had uh, last year. The year before was spectacular. The following year was lousy. And this year, we're on track to do somewhere in between those two. Not, not lousy, but not as good as the year before. Um, so some of our funds are restricted, as, you, as I said. Uh, some, um, some are not. And so we leave it up to the Board of Trustees and the staff to plug the money in where it's intended to go and to serve the best purpose it can. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to um, answer them if anybody has any questions. A question? The general rate of return is, Peter, help me. <laughs> um, I actually have that number. Nope. I'm going to lay down for just a second, and then I'll feed you more. Just give me two seconds. Um, every year we make a report to the um, FUS Board of Trustees, and in that report we uh, tell you what the rate of return is. And let's see. <laughs> Last year our total assets were down 16%. And uh, so our rate of return is, uh, the year before was a record-breaking 30%, and then last year it was um, a lot less. <laughs> it was negative, absolutely. And you can see that on the, re on the audited numbers, it was negative. Um, but I didn't actually calculate the actual percentage of return because it was so terrible, but you can see <laughs> in the numbers that it was a loss. And we don't anticipate a loss this year. Yeah, we anticipate it will be back up again this year. Um, I guess also it's good to tell you that we do not fundraise. The foundation does not fundraise. We are not in competition with the FUS Society to 
raise money for its annual budget, we merely are here to accept contributions to people who want to make a gift, primarily after they've gone through their estate. So that if you make a gift to the foundation, that money gets invested and you will continue to make an annual gift to the foundation. I don't want to say forever because nothing is forever, but for as long as we can uh, make it work. So um, if you have any questions, uh, you can see our names are on the report. My phone number is there. We have a page on the website you can look at. I'll be posting the audited financial statement there very shortly. And uh, please feel free to get in touch with us if you're interested. I think there, was there a question um, online? I see Lori nodding but also bouncing a baby. <laughs> I was wondering about the, uh, the, the audio went poor during the presentation and I wasn't certain about the, I heard that the 15% decrease in last year's budget and then there was something mentioned about the year before. Was that a 30% increase? And what are we basing an increase or decrease on? The year before, the year after, or what? Okay, so our return on, our return on investment two years ago was a loss of 30% because the market was horrendous in that year. And that's consistent across the board. We are not the only ones who lost that kind of money. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, that was, <laughs> now I'm getting all mixed up. So this, that was last year that we lost 30%. The year before that, we actually made 30%. It was re it was just an incredible year. Um, you don't you don't hear about returns of 30%. That's that's crazy. Um, and then to have the next year be such a lousy year was you know the correction to the market. And so this year this that we're currently in, we anticipate a, a normal year. It would be nice if we could make somewhere between 6 to 8% return. That would be lovely. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paul. No, we did not. It was two years ago we lost the 30%. I was not prepared to talk about this, was I? Um, we had a 30% return on investment in fiscal year 21, okay? The following year, fiscal year 22, we had a dramatic bounce back, and we made back most of that loss. No. You're right. You know, I, I shouldn't be talking about things right now because my life has been kind of a roller coaster lately, and so I'm messing things up terribly. I'm going to go at this one more time to clarify, and I'll read you from the report. After a spectacular 30% return on investment in fiscal year 21, the foundation saw a spectacular loss in fiscal year 22 consistent with dramatic returns across the market. That's accurate. I am so sorry. I don't mean to make this confusing. Elizabeth. I'm just looking at the Janet Stone Cipher Ministry Fund and wondering if anybody knows when is the next time we'll have a ministerial intern. It's a great question. Um, the larger issue is that there 
is a very small pool of folks interested in UU parish ministry. Two years ago, the number of people interested in parish ministry was five across the denomination. This past year, it was eight. So we have a dramatic decrease. People are going into seminary. They want community ministry. They want chaplaincy. They want justice ministries. They have no interest in being in a parish. And so we have let both Meadville Lombard know that is where Karen, Karen came from. We've let Meadville Lombard know and the UUA know that we are interested in having interns again. The pool of people interested is incredibly tiny and the majority of them are geographically bound to their current location. So we're not sure when we'll have an intern again. Okay, Susie. I just want to know about the micro uh, So several years ago, um, there was a fundraising initiative here at FUS to raise money to invest specifically in microfinance. And uh, it was a very successful campaign. I think they raised about $13,000. And the foundation agreed to match that up to $10,000. So we started out with uh, $23,000 some change, and we selected a couple microfinance organizations to invest in, and uh, it's changed a little bit over the years, and right now we, are, we have all of those funds invested with WCCN, which stands for Working Capital for Community Needs. They invest in microfinance projects, primarily in Latin America, and um, it's the only fund that we hold that is restricted only by how it's invested. Everything else goes into our general investment uh, program, but these funds, which are now up to 28 or 29,000, um, are invested specifically in microfinance. We do, it'll be coming up due to be renewed again, I think next March, and we will review that investment and see if we wanna stick with WCCN or if we wanna choose another microfinance uh, institution to invest with. Connie, we have a question online here. Lori, if you want to come off mute. Sure. I was wondering if we could have an update on socially conscious investing because of the concerns that um, continue to come up in all investment companies that they seem to invest offshore and that that's counter to our UU principles, uh, the way some, a fair amount of mainstream investment companies are functioning. Sure, um, Lori, thank you for that question. Um, we have investigated socially responsible investing. Um, you can call it SRI, you can call it ESG investing, you can call it a whole lot of different things. Um, and in fact, 20% of our portfolio is currently invested in a socially responsible fund. Um, it's an ongoing question that we discuss very regularly. And we are really in, um, we are really in a spot where we're searching for ESG or SRI funds that we can trust. Uh, we did have the president of the UUA Common Endowment Fund speak to us last July. And the fact of the matter is, is that, and they are totally invested in SRI and ESG funds, but they, their return is lower than ours by a full two percentage points on average. And so as we, continue to explore investing in socially responsible funds, it's going to be really important for us to analyze the funds that we feel are going to give the kind of return that we need because we don't want to see our annual contribution to the, to the church decline. So that's a tough one and one that we have in front of us front and center. So Connie, the question also had to do with offshore investing, and that's a completely different question really than socially responsible because much of the 
foundation is indexed and virtually any large capitalization company is worldwide. So you're going to have some you know, of the investments overseas. You know, um, if you want to have a further discussion on that, I would suggest that you attend one of our board meetings. We, we meet four times a year. We talk regularly about, obviously, that's our job, is to make sure our funds are invested profitably. So if you're really interested in pursuing that a little bit more, please, please come and see us, um, and we'll chat more. When is the next meeting? July, the second Monday in July, second Tuesday in July. It'll be on the, I'll, I'll put it in the red floors. Seven o'clock here at FUS. And actually, that is our annual meeting. We have an annual meeting every July, and we elect officers, and we always post it to the whole congregation. So you're all aware of that meeting, and anybody, who, we, we encourage people to come. So. Thank you, Connie. And thank you, Connie, for all the work that you do for the foundation. We really appreciate it. All right, then I am going to turn it over to Monica to um, share a little bit with us uh, about the budget um, before we uh, vote on it. So hopefully you have the information there in your packets and she will share a little bit more. Monica, are you there? I'm here, can everybody hear me? I sound good in the in the room. Great. All right. Well, I am Monica Nolan. I have been asked to present on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the Finance Committee about the proposed 2324 budget, which they'll ask you to vote on shortly. Um, and before we begin, I'd invite you to join in a moment of centering as we bring ourselves fully into this time. And we join together intentionally in community and in pursuit of our shared principles. And in particular, I'd ask you to notice any anxiety that may manifest in your body as we talk about FUS's finances, staying aware of your own money story and the glasses we wear when we think and feel through subjects of material resources. I believe that awareness has the potential to be both powerful and transformational. Okay. So I know you all don't have the benefit of a cat on your lap, just a couple of you lucky folks joining us virtually. I do. So I am fully blissed out and ready to, to move forward. I hope y'all are doing good in the room. Uh, so in your parish packet uh, and momentarily on the screen, I will sh uh, we can see the proposed budget for 2324. And in essence, the operating budget supports $1.8 million worth of programs and services that aim to support you in your personal and or spiritual development and connects you with others who are aiming to be a force for good in the world. Now, looking first at the income side of the equation, how do we estimate how much we anticipate receiving next year? And the answer is that we rely very heavily on historical data, especially two-year averages. Um, exceptions to that do exist when we have credible reasons to believe that actual income will be more or less next year than recent averages. So for example, we, um, we generally use that two-year average of actual income to help us anticipate how many pledge payments we'll receive from members. However, for next year's budget, our two-year average is from two pandemic years, which were also two uh, years of ministerial transition, and income therefore reflects a very particular set of circumstances that we believe contributed to lower than average pledge income. Other congregations of all faiths um, have reported similar pledge payment declines during the pandemic in particular. Um, so this piece of the puzzle is not unique to us. Uh, but after discernment with the Finance Committee, the Board of Trustees has decided that um, the two-year average plus an additional 5% or $55,000 to reflect anticipated pledge income increases next year um, is prudent. 
So as of May 11th, uh, 10 days ago, we had 347 pledge units totaling nearly $742,000, which is approximately 22 pledges and $9,000 more than last year at this time. Uh, so obviously we're hopeful that the positive uptick continues, especially because next year when we're budgeting, um, uh, sorry, next year, next uh, the budget that we're looking at, there aren't any one-time sources of income that are projected. So let me explain a little bit more about that. Um, we've received half a million dollars in government assistance over the past three years, which paired with the nearly one million dollars that we've received in pledge annually, um, in pledges, pardon me, has allowed us to avoid program and personnel cuts during the pandemic years. Uh, however, FUS has already acquired all pandemic-related government financial assistance. Uh, we, we received two rounds of PPP funds and an employee retention credit. Uh, and therefore, next year, we don't have the 100000 to 200000 k that we've been able to rely upon these last three years. Given this... Uh, the primary manner in which we have balanced the budget or proposed balancing the budget is like all years in recent memory uh, by leaning on cash reserves. So at the beginning of next fiscal year, we estimate we'll have $285,000 in unrestricted cash remaining. And this year, um, this coming fiscal year, we're, we're proposing using $175,000 of that cash to help balance the budget. Um, and that means that we anticipate having approximately $110,000 remaining in those cash reserves by the end of June of 2024. And by board policy, $100,000 is the minimum cash reserves that we'd like to maintain. Uh, so unless that cash reserve is replenished, we don't anticipate being able to tap into that income source in the coming year or two. The use of cash reserves, oh, we've talked about this before, um, unless replenished is not a sustainable long-term solution, though it can be an effective bridge towards a future in which income increases. Uh, and it has long been our hope that the reserve could last us until either our next capital campaign, which is anticipated to be launched in 2024, um, and we hope to pay down the remainder of our building loan um, tied to that capital campaign, which will obviously then decrease operating expenses. Um, so there's that one option. Or we hoped those cash reserves could be a bridge to income increasing um, more sustainably and organically. With operating expenses increasing annually and income decreasing, these reserves are dwindling, as I've just explained. So if income does not increase, then we will need to pursue expense reductions in future budgets. Um, before we zoom out uh, and take a look at expenses, uh, I would like to remind us again of the larger context that we believe is impacting our finances. Um, so first, we know challenges have been creeping up for many years at FUS as pledge units and total pledge dollars have dropped. Uh, the departure of a long-term minister, the interim ministry period, and the start of a new ministry team have all had fairly standard impacts on our income. It's very natural to recalibrate pledges during liminal periods. So COVID struck and hurt nearly all religious institutions, uh, especially smaller congregations. Um, but again, none of these circumstances are, are particularly unique to FUS. Uh, but in light of the income elements I just described, program budgets or expenses are proposed to uh, remain largely stagnant next year. Uh, and if you look at the bottom line, again, you can see uh, the proposed budget in your packet. You'll see that our expenses are projected to be only $500 more than this current fiscal year. Um, so there are no substantial changes to the expense side of the budget compared to last year. There are four lines, however, that are lower than this current year's budget. Uh, those are the personnel line, which we're proposing decreasing by 8,000, outreach offering projections by 5,000, 
operating expenses by like software uh, by 2K and worship expenses by 800. Um, in addition, some, some disappointing news about the proposed budget is that there are no cost of living or staff compensation increases included. Um, and while we're very grateful that we've been able to maintain our current employment levels and intend to continue prioritizing staff retention throughout the next fiscal year, uh, balancing a budget on the backs of staff is disheartening and it's unsustainable. And we remain very proud of the actions the congregation underwent over the last half decade to ensure that all of staff's compensations, at least temporarily, were in line with FUS's policies and the UUA compensation standards. Um, however, we need to continue to increase income at a rate that allows us as an employer to keep up with the standard expense increases like annual cost of living adjustments. Um, but again, in order to do so, we will need to increase income or find other creative ways to cut expenses. So what now? Um, almost done. Uh, though our circumstances may be typical, they are no less urgent or in need of congregational attention. And the Board of Trustees, the Finance Committee, and the staff leadership team wants to be clear that this is the sounding of an alarm bell. This is a call to action in no uncertain terms. We are very grateful to have a balanced budget proposed for next year. Um, we hope that you'll, um, you'll vote to approve it. And we are very fortunate to have this coming fiscal year to discern how to balance the budget without the use of significant cash reserves anticipated, um, without uh, anticipated one-time sources of income like the PPP and ERC funds I mentioned. Um, and we believe it will take detailed analysis, congregational discussion, soul searching, um, and we will likely have hard decisions, um, challenging decisions to make together. Uh, the Board of Trustees is optimistic about our congregation continuing to grow um, and deepen in its mission, uh, and we need your help. Uh, we, can't, um, we can't do this without you. Uh, we believe we need to mobilize as a congregation to raise income by re-engaging members who have stopped pledging recently. Uh, requesting that those who are able to continue to increase their pledges annually to do so, and to convert new members to donors. A couple of other priorities for increasing income long term include acquiring grant funds. Um, for example, we have a, a pending uh, grant application with FEMA for $150,000 to support mostly capital and security related expenses. Um, and also uh, another means of long-term growth are via, as Connie mentioned, growing the foundation's funds via legacy giving, um, obviously a portion of which are then distributed to FUS annually. Um, so in order to fulfill our mission and maintain our current level of programming, we will continue to prioritize staff retention as long as possible uh, however, it is understood that if we do not improve income or receive a cash infusion over the next year, and we have less than $100,000 in cash reserves, that we will likely need to pursue expense reduction. Uh, we have the remainder of this year to work on methods uh, for fully funding FUS and its mission moving forward. And we're optimistic that together we can create a sustainable budget that allows us to do the very important work that we are called to do. So there you have it. Um, I will switch screens and project the um, budget for those of you that are looking um, virtually. And again, thank you everyone for listening so intently. And I will hand it back to Alyssa for a motion to vote. Before we dive into um, a vote, any questions on the budget for Monica or the board? So just procedurally, right, we take, a, take the motion and then there's a discussion space after the motion is taken before the vote is actually undergone, right? So- Thanks, Kelly. Time. All right, yeah. Motion to approve. 
Got a motion in the room. Thank you. And a second. Second. Is that captured? All right. I can't hear anything coming from the room right now. Um, but we have a motion and a second, and so we will now it'll open it up for discussion. All right, and we have we have a discussion point. So, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks. Um, okay, so I only started reviewing this about uh, four or five days ago, um, and I was very very surprised to see no cost of living adjustment done, considering we just went through a year with eight percent inflation nationally, um, considering that the UUA is recommending 8.9% cost of living, just cost of living, not even like merit, to all these people that have stuck with us through a pandemic. Um, and I just don't think it's sustainable. I don't think we should pass a budget that has no cost of living improvement. It misses our ideals entirely. I mean, look at our principles. Um, look at uh, where we stand on those. Um, these are the people that are enabling us to meet those principles. And it feels a little backstabby, actually. Mm. <laughs> um, and perhaps even more important than that is that it's simply not sustainable. If you were a new member or a potential new member walking through the door and you saw the staff being treated in a manner where they're not even being valued to, so that they could meet their rent payments. I mean, we know what the rent payments in Madison have been mm -hmm. doing in the last few years, right? Um, they're insane. The numbers are 15% or more in the um, rental market. Um, so it's just not reasonable to not have a cost of living adjustment. Now I looked at, I left my phone back there, but um, I looked at the Midwest um, Consumer Price Index um, and it shows a month by month, year over year graph. So you can get some sense of what inflation is doing. And if you look at the current numbers, the very current numbers are 5%. Um, and so from that point of view, I calculated out. Um, so a secondary issue I think about this budget is that there's a lack of transparency. I don't really know how the money is truly being spent in where it's being put. But so I just use the top level. Um, our personnel numbers are 1.2 million, right? Um, makes sense, out of our 1.8 budget, 1.2 of it is personnel. That's what we live on and breathe on. 5% um, of that would be $61,700. And 9%, which is what the UUA is recommending, is $111,000. We have reserves of $110,000 after all of this is said and done we should at a very minimum be putting 5% of that, or 50% of that, the 61,000, to give people a 5% cost of living. It's unreasonable to have zero for all these people and all the work that they've been doing for us. Um, thanks. So I actually wanna put forth a motion. Um, I mean, I wanna continue discussion while we're right here but I wanna put forth a motion that tells our board to go deeper into our reserves, to spend the 61,000 at a minimum, to go to a 5% cost of living increase. And I really want it to be looked at to figure out if they can get it up to 9%, ideally through foundation. I'd like the foundation to be helping us. It's only through keeping our staff and keeping our staff motivated, but just keeping them. <laughs> that we will be able to continue and to grow our membership that we need to grow in order to be able to make the pledges that are necessary to get us to back to where we are solvent. So with that, I just wanna, leave, I wanna make that motion to, um, to dip further into our reserves. And I would also like to request more transparency in the budget. I'd like to understand uh, more why we are where we are and how the money is being spent so far. Yeah, the motion that I'm really making is that we have a minimum of 5% uh, 
um, and we look at it and determine if we can get up to 8.9, what UUA is looking. The motion I'm looking for is that. Until, okay, well then, I moved, to, well, I don't know that I want to accept the budget until we've had more discussion about it is the thing, so. Just to, for awareness, the folks online can't hear anything going on in the room if they aren't um, on mic. So if you wouldn't mind repeating some of the comments there, that'd be great. You see, like, they can only hear what's said into the mic. Oh, I see. You heard everything that I said on the microphone. You didn't hear what people on the floor are saying. Okay, you I'll got try it. and repeat yep. things back. If someone wants to raise their mm -hmm. hand, Thank someone you. said that they, we probably can't do a second motion before, is there a parliamentarian? Can someone tell me whether or not we can have a motion within a motion? So, sorry. Alyssa's the chair. What are you entertaining, Alyssa? Yeah, so I think that um, this would probably be an amendment to the motion. Um, if there is a parliamentarian or an expert in Robert's rules in the room, that would be great. Um, but I think that we could vote on, we, we could certainly discuss and vote on an amendment um, to the budget um, and discuss okay. that. Any comments in the room or folks that? I'll run I'm the sorry. Mic. I'll run the mic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ruth. Yeah, yeah that, that's. Uh, we're, I'm, going, I'm coming to you with the microphone yes, so we'll like hear you. To, I'd like to know your name, please. <laughs> uh, it's not on, but yeah. Yeah. Just take a second. Can people up there hear me now? Can people on Zoom hear me? Oh, I saw yep. a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, I'm Rudy Moore. Um, I spend most of my time in education. I've been teaching for the last 20 years or so since I joined in 2004, but I've been involved with FUS since about 1989. I was actually brought in by um, Ruth Gibson's daughter, Rebecca Gibson, um, who is doing super well in North Carolina right now. Um, but she brought me in and I taught Sunday school in high school, while I was in high school and in my early years of college. Um, did the Channing Murray group where I know Sam and Elizabeth. Uh, so I've got a lot of years with FUS yeah. and about 20 of actually being a member. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, Rudy, and, and thanks for your concern about okay, I'm, the I'm staff. Coming to, I'm coming to you, Sandy. I'm coming to you. I'd, um, before we get to the question in the room, I'd also just ask that if there um, are folks from the finance committee or board that want to comment on the use of cash reserves or Monica, of course, or um, the staff leadership team would um, love to share more information about that. Procedurally, it would be appropriate for someone to second Rudy's amended amendment to the motion, which I'm glad to do. Um, and then we could discuss the amendment to the motion. Then we would vote whether or not to accept the amendment to the motion. And then we would discuss the budget in its entirety, and then we would take a vote to accept or not the budget. Perfect. Thank Thanks you. For walking us through that, Sandy. Yeah. Cool. So there's a second for the amendment to, and to, to restate the amendment is to increase staff salaries by 5% using our cash reserves. So we'll open that up for discussion. Okay, so we have, the, uh, uh, we have at least one hand in the room here. Hi, Meg. So my understanding is that the motion for the amendment has been seconded, so we can continue to speak to both. So I'd like to propose a little bit of a counterpoint. I fully support the notion of cost of living. However, I'd like to know what our current membership is um, so that we know, um, like literally, because those people need cost of living increases too. I mean, like where can we draw from? Because I've already heard very clearly that we don't have cash reserves. Um, that uh, if we spend them down in the t this year, we will not have, we can do it for this year, but unless we plan for the future, it, that feels very short-sighted to me as much as I, um, on principle, support this um, idea of cost of living. And so I guess I'd like to know membership numbers right now so that, so that we have an idea of um, what proportion of people who are members are pledging 
uh, over the last couple of years and how much, like, how much membership have we lost over the last few years. So we know what we're actually dealing with in terms of people who can come up with income. Uh, Thank you. And Thanks, can, Meg, who, just because I hear a question about uh, membership, which is like a factual piece of information, I can tell you the current membership figure that we reported in February was 1,014 adult members. I don't have the figures over the last like three years, to, but I, I, it is that's, that does represent a decline, as Monica alluded to, uh, from during the interim period, which again is normal if not desirable. Monica, um, I think there's also a question about the use of cash reserves and kind of what the cash reserves means. Can you speak to that just to give people, because uh, I, I know that there's a, there's a use beyond rainy day dollars that I just want to make sure everybody has the information about. Yeah, I, I believe, so the policy was passed a year ago by the board to try to maintain $100,000 in cash reserves, right? And one of the reasons why that number was important was uh, because we do periodically have cash flow needs that in which we dip into that hundred thousand dollars. You know, that's sitting in our bank account, much like many of us personally might have a five hundred dollar buffer in our checking account, so that we don't overdraw it. Right? Um, we have a line of credit that we have maintained for the last at least seven years, so there is a solution for that but it's not without its risks. Uh, you know, if we tapped into the line of credit temporarily due to cash flow issues, um, with the, you know, anticipating we'd be able to pay it down and then we get, you know, we're hit with another pandemic, that is, that is a risk, right? Um, so that is the reason why my understanding, the $100,000 uh, policy around maintaining cash on hand it exists, if that's helpful. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Uh, we've got another, at least I see some hands in the room, so I'm just going to run to the first person I saw. Um, Kathy Luker, uh, while I understand the interest in increasing staff salary, I'm looking at the fundraising line and the fund, and the, um, fund transfer line. That's $140,000 uh, that we are going to have this year if we can do the fundraising that we would not have last next year and that's that's really a big gap and so i guess i'm interested in understanding the thinking behind the budget that pushes all of that off for a year and doesn't deal with part of it this year and if we added the five percent increase that number would be larger i'm really concerned that in a year we're going to be in much worse shape Uh, here, here's Paul. Did Monica want to reply to that? Uh, Is there a question from, for me? So, yeah, so Monica, can you speak to uh, Kathy's question? I would say the answer is yes. I mean, I, I, I hope, I hope what I shared and lifted up echoes that yes. I mean, that is all true. Um, we would have, oh, it, again, it's a bridge. The cash reserves is the hope is that it's a bridge that brings us to a brighter financial future. Um, this buys us time. It buys us time to to really buckle down and hopefully do all the things, all the calls to action that we we light we laid out for y'all. Um, so, Kathy, I I echo your concern, and um, I would I would say candidly that is why the board and finance committee and the leadership team didn't immediately recommend cost of living is because we were prioritizing staff retention in the short term in hopes that we can find a solution that allows us to maintain all staff and provides increases you know as time as time goes on next year hopefully okay i guess i understand that but i want us all to ask ourselves how realistic that is thank you Thanks, Kathy. Um, I don't know if anyone else is seeing chats here, so it's helpful if folks are chatting in to chat to all of the hosts. Um, but a couple questions here. Um, can we clarify individual members versus pledging 
households. So we have, um, I forgot the exact number that you said, Kelly, of number of individuals. 1014 versus, is the individuals. 1014 um, versus um, having how many pledging units. I'm not sure if Monica, if you have that information at your fingertips or not. The number I have at my fingertips mm -hmm. is is the one I lifted up a moment ago around how many pledge units we currently have. It so be, there it is. Uh, hold on, right let's hand. mute everyone real quick. Okay. Um, so as of 10 days ago, we had 347 pledging units or pledging households that had pledged $742,000. Um, and last year at this time, we had 325 pledge units totaling 733K. So in other words, we have 20, uh, we have more, we have more this year. And I will say that we continue to acquire pledges over the course of the coming fiscal year, right? So there's, we have 742 now, but we would anticipate that especially for those individuals that opt not to pledge, uh, but make a pledge payment, and then we interpret that intention from that pledge payment, those roll in the first quarter. So come July, um, we continue to see a larger uptick. Thank you, Monica. And uh, either Nancy or Mark has a question. They have their hand up. Feel free to come off mute there. Okay, so um, we heard that among the things that we might look forward to in the future, which would improve our income, would be a successful capital campaign to reduce or eliminate the debt the, the church still is carrying. And I'm wondering uh, how much uh, you know of a resource would that free up? Um, and that you know, and and what is the balance of that now? And uh, and is our uh, church uh, uh, partial payments permitted, so that you know that covers the normal questions around a, a, a loan of that kind. Um, so, Mark, currently we pay, we refinanced. You might recall three or four years ago now, um, which helped decrease the amount that with the pay down that we did from the last capital campaign. So currently, we are. You could see on your budget, we're paying one hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars a year towards the building loan or the mortgage. Um, and I I knew someone was gonna ask this number and I meant to look it up, but I wanna say it's around 3.2 right now, but I, I'd be happy to clarify via red floors and to you directly via email. We have a, a, at least one question here in the room. So is it okay to come back to that, Melissa? Yep, yep, go ahead. Uh, all right, Paul Stang, I've been on the finance committee for a number of years, so a couple of comments. Uh, someone made reference to the foundation. That's the payout on the foundation is five percent. So there's no tapping into the foundation. The number that she's uh, Connie's provided you is what will be. Okay, so uh, the foundation payout is is five percent, and so that amount as budgeted in here is what's set according to the foundation. So there's no tapping into that amount of money. Monica, question for you: You one of the budget items there you said is funds transfer 193. That's cash reserves, right? That's use of cash reserves? Exactly. In your discussion Q&A, you made reference to 175. So in fact, 275 cash reserves minus 193 leaves us with 82,000. So then we're- A small portion of those, Paul, are from, um, from the designated and restricted funds that we occasionally move over. So it is the combination of the two. Yeah. Most of it, the 175 is the cash reserve that we referenced. Okay, so I want to remind folks, most of you have been here, while one roof repair on the Landmark Center is easily $100,000. Remember, yeah, the heads are nodding, so they remember that. So when you say let's spend down the cash reserves, one leaky roof over there is easily going to wipe out 100000 And my understanding is it has the oldest continuously operating underground heating system in the ground in the United States, I believe. Anybody correct me on that? And so... Uh, we just don't know. That, could, that system could go out any time. So cash reserves are very important for things unexpected, like a leaky roof or the heating system in the Landmark Center. So folks, all of us would love to give a 9% raise. We don't have the money, period. We don't have the money to do that. Thanks, Paul. Um, 
This is Lori Cresswell. Um, you know, I pledged, and if I got a letter telling me that staff were getting absolutely no increases and would I be able to pledge a little more, I would be open to that. And I think there would be other people, and it might not get us to 5%, but has that been considered as an option to kind of reach out to people? Because it really it is disturbing, um, and so that might help some. Yeah, thank you. Um, the I'll I'll just jump in with a comment here, and I appreciate that comment. I think that was what we were attempting to do with the um, frequently asked questions in the budget packet. Um, you know, very clearly sounding the alarm um, that this is not um, a place that we can stay with our with our pledge income that's coming in. Um, I'll also just share for some transparency into the board conversation on this that um, we are also deeply troubled by not being able to give our staff um, cost of living increases at least. Um, this is not where we want to be in any way. Um, the conversation that we actually were having during that board meeting was whether to dip that far into cash reserves in a way that is absolutely not sustainable. Um, that's a, a action that we decided to take to ensure that we can keep all staff on staff. Um, and that is very important to us. Um, so the, you know, further spending of cash reserves um, beyond, you know, kind of a, um, a, putting some pretty big risks in front of us um, for not being able to maintain our congregation um, and, and um, deal with one-time expenses that come up. Um, in addition to that, there's one year that we can do that. Can't keep doing it. If we spend on a cash reserve at this point, um, there's just, it, 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 it's a way to kind of fill a gap for one year. So, um, so I appreciate the comment about, um, you know, about increasing pledges. That is absolutely, the way to do this is increasing pledges and um, and trying to um, trying trying to have more members pledge, increase their pledges, um, and to give what they can. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sean. Um, it's I'm tried to do a quick math, but if you take the amount and you divide it by the number of households that was just spoken. It's $176 a household. I'm not in any way being presumptive that everyone can do that in any way. Um, I grew up in a Catholic tradition. They did stand up and they would say exactly that. So I'm only saying that because that's the tradition I grew up in. Um, my daughter went to Chicago Loyola this last year. That's a hefty amount even though she got a scholarship. She's not going there next year. She traded to UW-Madison. Go Badgers. Um, that changes what I have to pay. So I for sure, personally, can change the amount that I pledged. And so I just wanted to say that piece um, in that rough math that I just did, so. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I, I know there are more hands in the room. Um, Alyssa, I'm looking to you for guidance about, I mean, I, I can keep finding people and I'm sure that I will, right? Uh, and at some point, uh, presumably a vote has to be held on the amendment to the motion. Um, and so I just wanna check in with you before I take the next uh, circle of hands. Yeah, I, I would just ask if there's any, um, in, so I, I, I think that would be uh, wise to, to move to a vote. If there's any other comments from um, leadership team, board, or finance committee, I just want to make sure that there's a chance to hear those. Oh. 
Okay. There are definitely hands in the room. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> okay. none, none of the sort that you, you address. I guess here's the okay. here's the, the issue I'm trying to highlight, right? Is mm -hmm. that this didn't this did not get activated with a time limit on it, right? Yep. Uh, which yep. is fine. I just also know that there's a limited amount of time that all the people in the room have, all the people online. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But without without a specific time limiting or someone calling the question, I'm going to keep taking hands. All right. Okay. Good. So, uh, Kelly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, let's let's uh, call the question of the amendment um, and um, and move forward with a vote on the amendment. Um, that is out there, um, which again, uh, if I'm stating right, does I, I don't know if Anne captured it, but that is to spend down our complete cash reserves to give staff a 5% um, cost okay, so of living uh, increase. So I think we have, we have can, can let's clarify the amendment. Well, I don't want to move on to call the vote yet because I don't feel like the discussion has gone far enough as far as that goes. Okay. Um, but the amendment wasn't that. The amendment was 5%, which at 1.2 million is 61,000, which leaves 50,000 in our reserves. And I had a few more questions for Monica. Okay, so can we take the questions? Yep. Great. Okay, so I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that we have a um, a line of credit, and I'd like to understand um, to the finance member's uh, question, how much is in that line of credit would be available in case there's some kind of catastrophe? Rudy, I, I'm going to admit I don't know. We've never utilized it. On an annual basis, Summit reaches out to me and says, you sure you still want it? And I say, yep. I want to say 100,000, but that's probably just the number that's been in my head because I know that's what I would want. Um, happy to look into it. Um, was there a second part of your question? Do, or yeah, was there? There yeah. is. Um, my point about the line of credit, I mean, nobody that wants to dump, uh, you know, go into a line of credit in order to pay for an expense um, mm -hmm. that can be planned for, for certain. Um, but the kind of thing you're talking about, um, in terms of a roof problem or such, if it's not an insured event, like a hailstorm or something like that. Um, we know about lifespans. We also know that that roof was recently replaced. We also know about Frank Lloyd Wright's design acumen. <laughs> um, but um, I think that it, I think it's eclipsed by the question of what is gonna happen to our staff. And this is my second part of my question for you, Monica. The, it's eclipsed by what's gonna happen to our staff. If we don't increase their um, pay by the cost of living change, we are actually taking away from their pay. Their effective buying power is significantly less. They're trying to make ends meet with the same amount that they had the prior year, but everything costs a lot more. Um, what Have you done a complete poll of the staff to ask them what their effect is going to be of having their having no cost of living adjustment? That's my question. We haven't done a poll, and Kelly, Kelly, feel free to chime in. Um, but we, but we do have a sense of how this impacts um, different staff members in different ways. Yeah, um, let me speak to that, Rudy. Um, at least try to address the spirit of the question. Um, the, the staff are aware of the budget that the leadership team passed to, to the finance committee, which passed it to the board, which is passing it to you now. Right, so that, that's the chain of development. Um, so the staff are aware. Uh, we've had a number of conversations. I trust that we will continue to have more conversations, both individually, staff members to supervisor, and then as the whole staff team. Um, uh, I do not want to anyway sugarcoat it. It's a very serious issue for the whole staff collectively, um, and also for individual staff members. Um, I think you can probably, I think we can all probably appreciate that this is not good news for anyone to not receive a, a cost of living increase. And it's dramatically more impactful depending on where your personal finances are. Um, especially hard on people who make the least and then there are also other exigent financial things that can affect a person's situation. Even if you're not at the very lowest uh, compensation level, um, you can still be living in a, you know, a 
a position where it's tenuous and the absence of a um, cost of living increase is significant. So um, I, I want everyone to hear the seriousness of this for the staff. Um, and I know that the leadership team uh, will follow the will of the congregation because that's our job, right? So that's, that's not in question. I do want to highlight that um, we, we passed this budget on, it eventually reached you, uh, not because we felt like it was a good idea to not give uh, compensation, uh, compensation increase to the staff. I mean, that's, we're, we are very disappointed about that. I am personally, uh, I have a personal deep amount of shame about it. This is the first time in my career that I've been a minister of a congregation that hasn't at least provided a cost of living increase to its staff. Um, I'll just say, from my perspective as one of the three people who helped build this budget, it, from my perspective, it's between this and cuts to personnel. And it is preferable one year, for one year, to not do that. If it was going to, if I thought that we couldn't then increase revenue, then the right thing would, to do would be to make the cuts now. Um, and I, I do need you to, I, do, I need people to have the information that boxed into you have to spend this amount of money, but there's no, there's no special additional revenue provided to pay that expense. Uh, that does potentially increase the likelihood that we have to make cuts to the staff team in order to fund the necessary increase in, the, necessary because it's what the parish has told us to do, uh, in staff compensation. Does that make sense? I mean, does that, does the logic of that work? Uh, it's very, very sad logic that I'm not happy about, but I, I want to be clear that that's the predicament we feel we find ourselves in. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I, I think I want to highlight that point too, but I think this is um, that we, uh, the board is not happy about the budget, but are um, confident that um, that the budget reflects an, a, an honest picture of where we are right now. Um, I think this is a, an income issue, not a budgeting issue, um, that the you know that it, it it is up to the congregation um, to decide whether we can have that sustainability built in in the form of of pledges. And of course, you know, pass, passing a budget that that we agree to. Um, but I, I do think that without having additional income, it puts us into some some dangerous territory for our congregation and our personnel, like you said, Kelly. All right, the, uh, I have uh, a shout out from Liza Monroe to ask to call the question, which I believe procedurally right. means uh, to take an immediate vote on whether or not to take a vote, right? Yeah. Got so it. All that's right. That's what's being called for. Okay, we will take a vote on whether to take a vote. So um, those in any other procedural comments there okay. in the room, sorry? I, I, okay, so, <laughs> Sorry, little little bit of little bit of, of of making sure that we're following appropriate process in the room. Thank you. Um, yep, appreciate uh, that. Sandy has very helpfully pointed out that you don't need an you don't need to actually vote on calling the question unless there's an objection. We have at least one objection, so that is necessary. By my understanding of calling the question, please someone correct me if I'm wrong, is that it means we are voting on whether or not to move to an immediate vote on the amendment not on the body of the budget, but on the amendment, because that's the thing that's on the floor right now. Is that clear to folks? I see some head nods in the room. Great, thanks, Kelly. And, and can we have someone read the amendment word for word before, um, before we vote on voting on the amendment, please? Do you have language captured, Anne? Anne is acting as our secretary today and taking minutes for us. Oh, excuse me, I'm very sorry. Okay, we are taking a motion to tell the Board of Trustees to go deeper into the reserves up to the, lim up to the 5% uh, increase of living. Thanks, Anne. All right. All right, 
Um, those in favor of uh, moving to a vote on the amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. So we okay. have some nays in the room, but by by my ear, the eyes have it. Okay. All right, then we will take a vote on the amendment, um, which we had a motion and a second for. So all. Okay. Sorry. Oh, um, those in favor of passing the amendment. Um, do we need to read it again? Yes, one more time, please. I, I'm hearing that. Thank you. Room. Yep, thanks. The amendment is a motion to tell the Board of Trustees to go deeper into our cash reserves up to the amount of 5%. Thanks, Ann. 5% cost of living increase for staff. Yes. Okay. All those in favor of passing the amendment, please vote aye. Say aye. 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 You need to vote. Take the hands of people here. Too. We're going to need to count. Yep. So we have three eyes online. Only three? Is it Hannah, Mark, and Nancy? Um, Can we move? To, oh, sorry. And Carol? And John? It, or I, John actually can't tell if you're. He's holding up his real hand. Okay, and a thumbs up. Yes, <laughs> thumbs up for I raise think of we hand. We need a hand eyes. count in the room, Alyssa. Yep, definitely. Uh, so go ahead and count the eyes before we move into the navel. Raise your hand if you're an eye. Online, just keep keep those hands up too if you are able to do the hand raise function by going into participants clicking on the three dots next to your name and raising your hand. Six. See. 22 I in the room. And we have four, uh, sorry, five online. Please, uh, if I don't call your name and you're voting I, let me know. So we have Marilee, Hannah, Mark, Nancy, and John voting I on the amendment. Carol, and too. Carol, and Carol. So six online. Can we move to a nay vote? We can in the room. Okay. All, all those opposed to the amendment, please say nay and raise your hand. Nay. 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 So keep your hands up, please, um, online so that we can get a vote. Yeah. Nay. Thirty-five in the room. Six. Seven. Thirty-five in the room, and for folks counting, Mark, you still have your hand raised. Yeah, Nancy and Mark, did you both vote to approve the amendment? Yes, we did. Okay, thank you. Let's get rid of that hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No worries. Folks can feel free to mute, <laughs> although I love that dog. Do we have a count online? 12, Lauren, what do you count? 12? I count seven. I counted 12 as well. Let's, can you read off who you have counted? 
<laughs> or should I should I read off Monica or Jenny? Do you have a, a can you read off who you have counted? I don't I don't have I don't know if Jenny has anything recorded. I was just looking at screen and noting. Jenny, okay. Conroy, Tim Conroy, Dorit Bergen, Jeannie and Becky, Rachel and Terry. But there's two in this one. Jake and Ann. Or Kurt. Is that two votes? Kurt and Kim. Chuck. I keep moving around. <laughs> Trouble is coming. One because Kurt had to leave. Just one for Kurt and Kim. They don't leave in here, though. Yeah. Now I have 14. Okay. That's what I got also. I see. Okay. Are you online? Uh, Mike, Michael Ryan Joy is also voting. Hey. Judy Troya. Lori Schwartz. Jake and Ann. I didn't hear you say my name. Oh, who was that? And Gwen Pine. 18. Okay. And Dory. Yes, 18. That's 18. I got. Okay. 18 nay votes online. And then um and then 35 in the room. 35 in the room. Yeah. Great. And anybody um any anyone abstain from voting. Feel free to come off mute and just say that. Okay. I do. Jackie. Okay. Thank you. Unregistered abstention. Can we read off the total numbers? So did Anne get a chance to capture that? Yeah. Do we have the eyes online again? That was was it seven? No, eighteen. Eight. Eight, eight eyes. eyes. The nays were eighteen. Six. Six. So I think, I believe it was 28 in total. Was it 22 in person and eight, sorry, six virtual equals 28. And for nays, uh, was it 35 in person and 18 yes. virtual, so 53? Yes. And then what abstention? Yeah. Okay. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm, I, do you, so the totals for eyes is? 28. 28, and the total nays? 53. Okay. So the, the motion for the amendment um, does not pass. Um, then um, we, it, we still need to vote on the budget. <laughs> so to um, approve the budget um, and we have a motion and a second for approving the budget. Um, let's so move, move to move back to discussion on the original motion, right? Yep. Original yep. Okay. motion. I've got at budget. least one hand in the room here. Okay. We'll take okay. A, a few more comments on that. Okay. So I think people were mostly upset about perhaps not being able to meet the 100,000 reserves um, and that they didn't want to go into those reserves um, without like trying to nitpick and try and get into a smaller number and smaller number or whatever. I have an alternative that would be a different way um, that I'd like to put a motion forward with. Um, this budget has a spending, has a pledge in uh, amount of one, $1 million basically. Um, which we haven't met yet. Uh, it's currently at a variance, like I think she said 742 is the number that I think is currently met. What I would like to propose is um, that if we get pledges over, so we can put out some kind of ca campaign, at least to tell people that we have balanced our budget on the backs of our staff. Um, we, can play, we can phrase it nicer than that, um, but that's effectively what we're doing. My suggestion is this. 
um, whatever amount up to that 5% number that we get over $1 million should be given as a bonus pro rata to our staff at the end of the year. So effectively, it's a bonus above and beyond whatever they would normally be getting that would be limited to that amount of that 5% increase. It's not as great because people need to be able to rely on their salaries, but at least that it shows them that we're not just throwing them by the wayside in order to balance our budget, trying to, presumably if they walk out, we're gonna be going to the temp services to fill their spaces, or maybe it's, maybe by doing a 10% cut, we are effectively cutting our uh, people um, by a backdoor method of letting them walk out before um, we actually just remove their position. But regardless, this is an, I, think, I feel like this is a reasonable way. If we are above our budget anyway, in terms of our pledges, then we can take that money and divide it among our staff to show them that we actually do care about them. I second the motion. Okay, That's so then I'll, I'll, motion I'll to, rephrase. Yeah. I'm gonna rephrase it for transcription benefit because um, I think the other one got a little confused. Um, any amount received from pledges above the budgeted amount, which is $1 million, um, up to 5% of the salary number, so there's a cap at the top, will be um, given to our staff pro rata per their salaries as a cost of living bonus, effectively. Mm -hmm. I second the motion, Nancy Betterschultz. Did you, um, how did you do on capturing that, Anne? Do you feel like you got the language? I just, I wanna, but we're asking a lot of you, so I wanna pause and just you know, check in and make sure you got what you need before we move on. Thank you. Okay, okay. That's, that's the, uh, All right. the new Motion amendment. is captured. Okay. Yep. So we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? I call the question, Nancy Vetterschultz. Okay. I would ask. Um, what, we'll start in the room and then Nancy's called the question. I so then we'll ask, vote on it. Um, the, the motion provider, how uh, to compensate for the fund transfer loss in the next year. Well, yep. if we increase the staff line, which I'm not necessarily against, we're still looking at $118,000 loss the next year with the fund transfer. So how does that, how would you compensate for that? Sounds like a question to you, Rudy. Well, there's a problem with this budget in that it's not transparent exactly what that fund transfer is. Monica, can you explain that a little better for me? So the fund transfer is just the moving of cash reserves into the operating budget. Oh, the $193,000 that we're receiving this year is for this year's budget. And my proposal is for this year's budget. And the difference that you're talking about the fact that we're not gonna have $193,000 next year is not part of my motion, nor is it part of what we've got elsewhere. We're gonna to have to solve that problem before the next budget comes out. But, but my, my point is about our staff and keeping our staff from walking out and keeping our staff basically taking care of them the way our religion tells, them, tells us that we should be taking care of them. That's what. Got it. Uh, we've got another hand in the room. Uh, we have had someone call the question online. Okay. I guess my hand was raised before that. So I just wanted to okay. clarify the amendment. Initially, when we talked about the amendment, it was up to 5%. And then when you just read the amendment, there was no cap. So I'm asking, are we doing that amendment up to the 9% increase? Because that's, that would be my recommendation. I, I like the idea of the 9%, but my, what I read, what I meant to read the first time was 5%, mostly because I was, um, I want to have a cap because if we make more, then that goes to that $118,000 shortfall that we get. And hopefully we will end up with more as we get more pledges over the course of the year. And as we hopefully draw a new membership too, we've got to bring our membership up, obviously. Okay, maybe we could clarify that because when you read it out the second time for the motion, I didn't hear that cap. So that might be me. 
She's got it. Okay, so the it sounds like seeking clarification. The clarification is there is a the, the cap on this one-time bonus to staff is a maximum of a 5% increase over their current salary. Uh, I think you can, okay. but that's actually a different motion because the amendment came from one person and that's what they amended to. Uh, yep. Laney, yeah. Hello, I'm totally, I'm I'm Laney. totally confused. I'm oh. totally confused. I just have something I want to say while I'm, you know, cleaning up in the kitchen, so I just want to get a chance to say it. Um, you know, we struggle financially at home and in doing what's best for our children, and we had to make cuts to our programming of our family um, to make sure that mom and dad were happy and healthy so that our family could be happy and healthy. And I'm interested in knowing what else in the budget and in our programming could be cut so that our staff can be happy and healthy um, because they literally hold this place together. And I think that everyone that voted uh, no to that cost of living, which includes me, I voted no, um, I think you should get your butts in here and volunteer for shit. Thanks, Lainey. Um, uh, there is a question here about what what else basically is in the budget. Um, I mean, I can speak to that. I feel like you're best positioned to speak to it, Monica. Um, but what what's your pleasure? <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a it's a long answer, and I'm not sure we have the time for it. It's our our budget supports our programming and our personnel and operational costs. Um, and we have worked over many years to whittle those expenses down as much as we possibly could. Um, that doesn't mean there's not always room for creative ideas. It's just um Please, help I'll talk to you back. We're still in the meeting. Hold on one second, let me help you. Um mm -hmm. it's it's a challenging line of thought because uh, many minds have have tried to uh, tackle that problem already. And this is the suggestion that we're coming up with. In other words, golly, if there was other things to cut, we certainly would have cut that first. Um, this is, you know, not doing cost of living increases uh, is a last resort. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, I, I, would just, I just wanna echo that. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I feel very deeply the desire to find the money somewhere else. Um, our, our best sense is that we have successfully trimmed the areas that the congregation spends money in other than staff uh, to the point where there would be a very, very profound change drop in program, program possibilities, like what we can do uh, if we made any significant cut, any measurable cut that would like help us with this shortfall um, from those areas. Uh, you can, you're still empowered to come back and tell us to do it anyways. Um, but th as Monica said, this is, this is the budget we turned in because this was the absolute least bad thing we could think of to do. And it's bad, like it's bad. Like but there's no disagreement in the room, I think, that it's bad. So, um, uh, anybody can come and sit down. I, well, anyways, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Um, so I, I am going to jump in here. I know there are still a number of folks who would like to um, share. We're also creeping up on a fairly late time for our parish meeting. Um, and I am worried about losing quorum um, to not even be able to vote on this. Um, so um, I'd like to move to a vote on the second amendment, or sorry, on the, not on the second amendment, on the, on the um, second uh, amendment that, that Rudy put forward. So we have a, a motion and a second. Anne, can you please read the amendment again? Nope. Let me give you a microphone, Anne. Any amount above one million, up to five percent, will go as bonus to staff at the end of the year. Thank you, Anne. All those in favor of this amendment to the budget, please say aye. 
Aye. So if you could please keep your hands in the air. Thank you so much. I believe we're voting on the amendment is my understanding. This is the amendment. Yep. Case 17. 17 online. And is there a count in the room? Hey, yes, 42. 42 in the room. Okay. Uh, those opposed, please say nay. Nay. Okay, if you could please raise your hand so we can count. And folks that voted aye, please make sure to put your hands down. We got 13. Let's try one 13. more time. Sorry. One, two, three. Pass and count to the quorum. Okay. Take four, please. Yep. What, what number did you get? 13, yes, 13. 13, and there's four here. Okay. Okay, so that is 59 eyes and 17 in the room. Uh, any abstain? All right. Then this uh, motion for the amendment carries. Abstention online. One abstention online. Thank you. Um, and I will just comment on that. The let's make it happen. Then this is uh, up to the congregation now. So great. Thank you. All right. I'd like to move to a vote on the budget with the amendment, obviously in place. And the budget has. We've had a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the budget as amendment as amended, please say aye. 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 And can according to the room, can we do a voice vote for nays? Let's do a voice vote for nays to determine whether we need to, to do a full count. So um, those opposed to approving the budget as amended, please say nay. Come off mute and say nay. I don't see any online. I think uh, Tim, Mark and Nancy were not nay votes, right? You were I votes for the budget approval as amended, okay. Any nays in the room? No. Okay, then the budget's approved. Okay. Uh, I'd like to abstain. Oh, I'm sorry, Lori. <laughs> sorry. Yep. Any abstentions? Yeah, yeah so, I would yeah. also. I would also like to abstain, Jake Blaster. Okay. Thanks. Two abstentions online. Any in the room? Are we ready to move on in the room? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Okay, so four abstentions total. Thank you. Okay, I know we are running late for, th so thank you for, for folks for sticking with us and appreciate the discussion on, on the budget and, um, and especially um, the care and concern for our staff. Um, I, I know that that is something that we all care deeply about um, and really, really appreciate the discussion there. Um, I would like to move into vision and mission statement, probably without um, much presentation here. So I think Emily's in the room. Um, Emily, if you want to move into um, sharing our final vision and mission statement, this is something that we need quorum to vote on so if folks can stick around for a couple more minutes, that would be 
Great. So Emily, I will hand it over to you. We, I think we lost quorum. Thank you, Alyssa. Yep. Can you hear me online? Yes. Excellent. Um, I will keep my presentation about the statements very brief. Uh, there are two points that I would like to highlight about the statements that the task force uh, and by extension the congregation worked on over the last church year. Um, the first is that we wrote these statements by a congregational process. Um, there was a period of feedback and input in October and November um, that allowed uh, the task force to develop the draft statements. Um, and then in March, we shared with you draft statements and asked for your feedback again. You provided very thoughtful feedback. We really appreciate it. It's important to me and I think to the task force overall that these statements were developed by incorporating as many voices as possible um, and not by one or two people sitting on their own in a room. So thank you all for the input you provided to help us develop these statements. I hope you see it reflected in the statements we have for you. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that the work of these statements does not stop with our vote today. If we appro approve these statements, in order for them to do their job, we have to choose to live into them. They need to inform the work that we do as a congregation for the years to come. And so that is my ask to you all, is that if we vote to approve these statements, that we all work together to make them a reality. So with that said, I will read the statements that we have. Our proposed vision statement. The vision of First Unitarian Society is to be a community of belonging. Through the practices of welcome, deep listening, and compassionate, authentic connection, we will create radical possibilities for transformation in ourselves and society. We envision a world fueled by love and justice. And our mission statement, at First Unitarian Society, we question boldly, listen humbly, grow spiritually, act courageously, and love unapologetically. Um, I want to clarify very briefly. I think, so the mission statement stayed the same between the drafts that we presented in March um, and what we are proposing now. The vision statement was edited slightly I believe this is the draft, not the final proposed vision statement. Oh. I have the, um, I think I can share here. Okay. Yep, just a second. Um, I think I can anyway. Are folks able to see that? I can can't. you see? It? it looks good to me. So you have the draft statement up top and then the proposed final statements at the bottom. Yep. Does that look right, Emily? It does look right. Thank you for sharing that, Alyssa. Thanks. So they are the statements are pretty close together. It's the addition of a couple words, the removal or, or, or repositioning of a couple words. Um, I can read the vision statement one more time. Um, the proposed final vision statement is, the vision of First Unitarian Society is to be a spiritual community of belonging. We will transform ourselves and society through the practices of radical welcome, deep listening, and compassionate, authentic connection. We envision a world fueled by love and justice. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. All right. And I believe we still, um, I believe we still have quorum with folks in the room and um, folks online. So um, if there is a motion to approve the vision and mission statement, I will take that. I move to accept the vision and mission statements with great applause and deep love. I think these are wonderful. Thank you, Nancy moved with deep enthusiasm for the vision and mission statements. And a second? I second. Judy, thank you. Any brief Any discussion? Brief. 
All right. Then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say nay. No nays here. Anything in the room? No. Nope. All right. Then the motion carries. Huge thank you to. Okay. Huge thank you to Emily and the whole Mission and Vision Task Force for their hard work. They have poured so much passion and energy into these statements and it's very exciting to to carry us forward in our mission and vision here at first unitarian thank you all right then i believe we are at closing kelly if you can close us out here kelly AJ. thanks Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you all for staying so long. I'm uh, going to just tell you that the next thing in this room is a special concert being given by local artist and scholar Quanda Johnson. So you stay this long. If you want to hang out for a little while more, that's starting at four. And here is a reading from Jill Beth Sweeney Schultheis. We are fragile. We are not broken. We are <laughs> imperfect. We are not flawed. We are curious, we are not confused, we are vulnerable, we are not weak. We are of this earth and yet the divine lives in us. When I feel as if I am going to break, I am the most human. And when I embrace my fragility, I let you into my imperfect world. Thank you for your time, energy, and care. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.